This episode of The Edge is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek.fm at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trek.fm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. You're listening to Trek FM. What have you done out there on the edge of Federation space? Welcome, listeners, to Postcards from the Edge. I am your host, Amy Nelson, and with me this week is Haley Stoddard from Standard Orbit. Haley, thank you for coming on Postcards. Well, thank you for asking me, and thank you for having me, and it's always fun. I love sitting down and recording with you, and we get to do it, like, so much now. (laughs) I know. We used to never, unless we had our Standard Orbit Earl Grey crossovers, and now we're talking every week on Discoville. It's so great. It is. It really, really is. Yeah. So why don't you tell our listeners, in case they aren't listening to Standard Orbit, and they should be, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So if you are not listening to Standard Orbit, as the name implies, we talk nothing um, but the original series. That includes all three seasons. It includes the TOS films and the Kelvin films, because technically those are TOS as well. They it's are. Really fun. It is. You, Zach, and Ken do a great job, and I listen every week. <laughs> oh, thank you. We're we're having fun with it. Uh, I'm super excited. We're going to do some stuff involving uh, Pike and Cage and things like that coming up just because of what's been going on with Discovery. So we're talking a little bit later, so listeners can stay tuned. We're going to talk about the Cage. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure everyone has rewatched The Cage. <laughs> and Or watched it for the first time. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping a lot of people went back and watched it for the first time and are like, oh, this is great because I loved it. Yeah. Are you listening to Anson Mount's podcast by chance, The Well? I haven't yet, but uh, there's so many. Yeah. Well, I listened to it and he had uh, Ethan Peck on. And it was interesting, just a little side bit, like he was talking with Ethan and saying, you know, their characters, you know, are similar in the fact that they're playing a character where it's the middle of the story because you have the cage and then the menagerie and he's playing right smack dab in the middle and same Mm -hmm. with Ethan Peck with Spock, you know, so that was an interesting insight and I hadn't thought about that because usually, you know, if you play a character it's either the beginning or the end of a story. So I thought that was interesting. It really is. And I, I'm i loving it. Uh, I'll have spot comments later, but I'm, I'm definitely loving this middle bit of Pike that we're getting. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm all on board. Yeah. <laughs> but we've talked about that before. We have. So. <laughs> yes, we are in it for Pike. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> well, today we are going to discuss the fan response to Season 2, Episode 8, If Memory Serves. Now, if you would like to participate and share your response, please post your comments on the Babel Conference. That is our listeners group on Facebook. Type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field and it will come right up. Now, at the time of this recording, we had a whopping 415 comments. Holy moly. That's insane. Yes. I was telling you, I'm like, I feel like we have just broken warp 10 because this is the most that I've ever documented. Um, that is a 68.7% increase from last week. Of 246 comments. So Jeez. we are full warp ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think we might be in trouble with our, our warp on that one. I know. <laughs> Systems failing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We might have people coming telling us, hey, this is too much. Yeah. Can't do this anymore. 
Well, I am very excited, listeners. Um, it is so nice to see everyone's comments. I feel like I'm just coming back to old friends, and I have tried to include as many comments as possible this time. So we're just going to go through, read them. But first, Haley, tell me, what did you think after watching this episode? Like, what were your thoughts, you especially knowing the original series so well? Yeah. Um so I know that some people are not loving the opening with this. I know some people love it just because there are those people who probably have never seen the cage. Um, I enjoyed it because they played it like it was a memory. Because when we when we come into Discovery, Pike is there. And it's almost like he's recalling all of that and everything that happened. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And... Overall, I really enjoyed the episode. There was a lot of things that I felt fit really well, but were updated enough from the cage when we finally get to Talos 4. And the character development and seeing finally what happened between Spock and Burnham, and that was just incredibly heartbreaking. And and same with when Vina comes on and she's talking to Pike in his ready room and I, you could just see how much he felt and how much emotions that he felt for her and knowing that he could see her again. I just, it was beautifully meshed quite well. Um, I was a little concerned knowing that we were going to tell us where I try to not watch the next time on Star Trek discovery <laughs> because I don't want to know anything. And, and so I knew we were going there, but um, the only thing that bugged me was trying to figure out why Burnham and only Burnham did not know about Talos Four. Everybody else did. You know, there's that scene on the bridge where Pike says, we're going to Talos Four, and everybody kind of turns and looks at him like, uh, we're not supposed to go there. And I think Awoshikun even says that's restricted airspace. But somehow Burnham had no knowledge of this is what I really would like to know. And I think I've kind of figured out why, but um, I don't know if anybody else has, so we'll read comments. And then if not, I'll, I'll say what I think happened. But that was the only thing I think that bothered me about the episode. Well, very good. Well, as usual, listeners, I will uh, withhold my um, original or my initial thoughts because um, I'm going to be on the main show with Patrick. So you can uh, listen for that. <laughs> so let's get to what the fans had to say. So, Haley, why don't you start us off? All right. So, Mark, and I'm sorry if I butcher your last name, Flessa. Uh, says that previously on Star Trek is one of my favorite things ever. It somehow embraces the connectedness and unity of Star Trek canon more than anything's made since Trials and Tribulations. Yeah, I yeah. definitely, I didn't even think of Trials and Tribulations. And that was, I think, very well connected. So thank you, Mark. Chris Tribuzio says the writers did this for us, their fleet. Family, the Burnham Spock storyline, legacy, the opening and callbacks, absolutely fantastic episode. Emotion, Burnham Spock, Pike Vina, Leland Philippa. Excitement, Talos for recreation, the blue flowers, Vina for the first time. Tactile, the whole episode was so cerebral, vivid, emotional, it was right there for us to touch it. I truly enjoyed it. Now, Chris... I think you had a challenge that was a three word challenge and family, legacy, emotion, excitement, tactile. Mm, I think I can count. And that's more than three. <laughs> I got to yeah, give him a hard time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And no, I, I can see what he's saying. Although Leland and Philippa, that's that's an interesting dynamic there. Yeah. Interesting that he recognized that and t pulled them. Yeah. She's definitely out for him. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, and again, man, you're giving me the hard names here. Oh, Any sorry. Names? Sanjeev Gopal. Okay. It says, OMG, for the first time in a long time, an episode of Trek made chills go down my spine. I don't even know where to start with this episode. The way they tied in the cage, the depth they've added to Spock, the love that Pike has for Vina, and let's not forget the scene with Pike and Saru in the turbo lift discussing Saru's decision to let Culver and Tyler fight. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, that scene had me laughing out loud uncontrollably. I was giggling. I loved that. You could, oh, 
Pike's face in that. And he's just kind of, as Saru's talking, he's not even looking at Saru. And his facial expressions, he was emoting so great. I loved it. Yeah, there were some comments like, Saru's sass was just perfect in this. <laughs> Tim Robertson says, I love that we are beginning to see the struggle that Pike is dealing with emotionally and professionally. That definitely is coming through each and every episode, you know? It's really good. It is. And I'm, well, I'm, I've already said I'm in it for Pike, so we'll leave it at that. Robert Joseph says, as long as a longtime OG TOS fan, this episode was the bomb. Thank you. I am so glad that. We've got fans from really just the beginning of TOS, and they're enjoying it. And and that's a huge thing, I think, for those original, original series fans. If they enjoyed this episode, you know it was good, and it was well done. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Robert, and to all my listeners, um, I did have to change one of your words, and let's not swear, uh, you know, Starfleet Federations require us to have... Nice language. So uh, I want to include your comments. So please keep the swear words out. Just your little reminder from the teacher, Miss Nelson. <laughs> All right. Alexander Sanchez, my perpetually unimpressed uncle and my uber fan aunties, all of whom watched TOS from the man trap onward, agreed this was a great episode. So old timer stamp of approval for all the excessive lens flares, finally. Yeah, again, just good to hear that so many original fans are enjoying this episode. Yeah, and I, I think that's what's really super important, one of the important things of this. Chris Foster says, I got emotional at the D story, Stamets Culber's journey. I had tears watching the waves of disappointment and loss play over Stamets' face. He's essentially losing his love a second time. I hope that we learn more about what Hugh is going through. This was the most connected and invested I felt to their story in a long time. And I completely agree with you, Chris. That was, oh, that was so hard. There was so much heartbreak in this episode. Yeah. And the undercurrent of that. Yeah, you're right. Losing him for a second time. And this one even more painful. Like, you know, first he was taken from him, but now it's choice. Culver's choice. And that's yeah. harder, I think. Oh. Uh, Dennis Bellinger says, season two keeps on giving. Vina was there. What a great bridge to make between the cage, disco, and the menagerie. Leland is going to end up having his beep handed, handed to him by the Empress for sure. Watch out for Irium. She is up to no good. Yep, there's definitely something going on with Irium. Big time. Oh, I completely agree. I think there was something uploaded when the probe was accessing their files, and only she would be the only one to be affected by it. So, yeah. Yeah. And th th she's framing Tyler. I know. Ah! Oh, my gosh. That was in – I think it's because they – and I have a theory on that. But I think it's because they – Section 31 was – worried because of Tyler's relationship with Burnham that he would not do the job that they sent him to do. Hmm. Interesting. Do you want to hear the rest of my theory really quick? Yeah, I do. I think that that probe, because it's 500 years from the future, I think that is, and, and Section 31 has always had way more advanced tech. I think Section 31 got the probe and sent it back with whatever tech that they had, and that was Section 31. Ooh, so it's I like section it. Section 31 from the future. Yes. Somehow manipulated Arium. Yes. Yes. Ooh, that's, I like it. That's that is my theory. Okay, you we'll heard see. it here first. Yep. All right. Bill Sweet says, OMG, that was so much fun. I love how this fills in the menagerie a bit as Spock paying back an old debt to Pike, and it shows how he was in contact with the Telosians, which was always a head scratcher for me. Still no answer on whether General Order 7 exists yet. They kind of sidestepped that one. And Burnham, being the impetus that drove Spock to logic, isn't probably going to sit well with some, but I'll accept it. Retcon never feels as satisfying as headcanon, but it is what it is. Previously on, I was screaming. Vina, more screaming. Peck is solid as Spock, and the sibling repartee was golden. 
really nervous about what's up with Arium. How many episodes left? It can't be as easy as her being the Red Angel, right? And Wilson Cruz should get an Emmy. Oh my gosh, yes, Wilson Cruz should get an Emmy. His acting in this episode <gasps> was amazing. I really could not believe like how believable yeah. I, you went on that journey with him. You did. Yeah. Oh, from being and, confused uh, and angered and raging and oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, and it's understandable. And I like that we're seeing that because I think so many times Trek just kind of does stuff and then it leaves it and, and we don't see it. And this is why I love, um, it's only a paper moon in DS nine because it's following up with what happened to Nog and, and we don't see that enough in Trek. Sometimes it's just left. Yeah. And it's like, oh, next week everything's fine. And mm-hmm. it's like, no, there's not. So, but I think we have um, six episodes left because this was eight, right? Because there's 14 episodes. Yeah. The yep. final one will be uh, April 18th. And I counted because there's something that weekend that I'm going to. And we're t- <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's We're on the downward Oh, Rob Vaughn says a quick comment for postcards, possibly my favorite episode so far. I'm telling you, I hear that every week. So yes, Rob, I think many agree with you. The opening scenes with the previously on Star Trek was fun. The look of Talos 4 was excellent and the sound effects spot on Mount Peck Cruise, all outstanding. Thank you, Rob, for your comment. That was on Twitter. I do pull from Twitter as well. uh, So you don't always have to uh, comment on the Babel conference. Yeah, I love that sound effect. And for people who do not know, because I was looking into this, um, that sound effect from the cage, that actually became the background sound for the planets in season one and two of TOS. And then they also used it in the films as well. So if you go back and you watch the original series, you'll hear that sound in seasons one and two when they go on planets. Interesting. From the singing blue plants. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I know. Uh, Christoph Zaplatal. Hopefully I said that right, and I'm sorry if I didn't. This was just awesome, he says. The writers managed to really tie the events of the cage into the current storyline and enhance on Pike's and Spock's background. The recap at the beginning binds it all together and firmly anchors Discovery in Trek's lore. Using the original footage says that they acknowledge telling stories in the same universe, just in a different visual style. Amen to that. I think it was a bold move to do that. But as usually, Discovery does the bold move. I could not agree with you more. Thank you for saying that because it's 2019. The visuals are going to be better now. Yeah. And it was interesting because in season one, there were still some questions of, is this really, you know, 10 years after the cage, like the placement? And now this is firmly rooted. Yes, we are after the cage. Definitely. So, yeah, I thought that was great. Kevin Lee Heaven Street. Oh, Kevin. I really loved memories as the episode's recurring theme. Michael is haunted by her memories. Colbert can't recognize the man he was. Tyler is struggling with his competing loyalties, and Spock's memory of the future are weighing him down. If memory serves was a risky endeavor that paid off. Yeah, that is a great theme to pull out of this memories. I didn't even think about that. I'm like, yeah, what is the theme? And it's it's exactly right. And like Pike's memory of the cage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, Okay, Rhea, I am sorry. Papa Giorgio. Okay, thank you, Amy. (laughs) She's coming to Vegas. (gasps) See, more people I'm going to miss. Anyway, says so much squealing in like all caps. Okay, you got to know I'm a TOS OG to the core. I get excited seeing cage scenes in the menagerie for Pete's sake. That intro, I went from squealing like a schoolgirl to jaw on the ground to teary-eyed to WTF, why are they doing this? Is Doing this, is this just cheap fan service? And then they cut from Pike to Pike and my soul sang. It was awesome. 
Love the sounds of Talos and, of course, Michael touching the singing leaves. Love the episode. The only thing I didn't like was the casting of Vina. I really, really, really disliked her casting. She was more like Amanda and nothing like the rock star Susan Oliver. I was hugely disappointed by her. But loved that intro oh so much. Previously on more than half a century of Star Trek. Just watched it again and teared up all over. Um, yeah, so yes, I, I completely agree. I had all those range of emotions myself. Um, I believe, and I don't know her name, um, the actress who played Vina, she's an Australian. So did not hear her accent at all, as I know many Aussies myself. Yeah, uh, that was a range of emotions there, Rhea. And I also was like, what? Wait a minute. Am I sure? Is this fan service? But I think they, in my opinion, did it well. So I was absolutely fine with it. Yeah. Mark Keller says, hi, guys. Hi, Mark. I think season two is becoming one of the greatest seasons in Trek history. What did you think of the cage opener? I like the idea of showing the scenes from the original, but I didn't like how it presented it as kitsch. Mm Mm-hmm. I didn't show, it didn't show a lot of respect for TOS. I would like CBS to cut an alternative edit and put it up on the site. People could then choose if they wanted the comedy or serious opener. Love the podcast and what you do. Well, thank you, Mark, for your thoughts. Um, we will get a little bit more into our questions and complaints about the cage opener because there were some people that had some concerns, but I like your suggestion and interesting. Manny Cabrera says, the magic of this show is that they've created characters that dare you to believe they're real people. I love this episode from beginning to end this week. Still feel Section 31 is basically unnecessary, but okay. Well, I think now that we know we've got a Section 31 spinoff, so I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of them. I could I could have a little bit less. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Brando Calrissian says that was an amazing episode. Disco is at its best when using nostalgia throwbacks while at the same time adding backstory and depth to characters, places we know so well. This episode got me right in the feels on multiple levels. Bravo. Chris Chaplin says, if memory serves, calls on its viewer to recall canon as if it were a valued bedrock for Discovery's narrative and characters and themes. This is the clearest moment that this show has wholly embraced Star Trek's canon. A canon matters because, to borrow from the prophets, it is linear and so are we. I imagine this is what TNG fans experienced when Sarek arrived on board the Enterprise. Despite the possible burden of canon, this episode vibrated with genuine emotion, character complexity, and an interesting plot and mystery. It never felt overstuffed. The elements of the cage probably helped, even helped reduce the overcrowded crowd, feeling of this episode. This was nearly perfect. I agree. This episode didn't, it didn't feel rushed. And I didn't feel that there was too many competing storylines to go on. It really kind of flowed well. Yeah. And we've talked about uh, even in this season and especially in season one, like there's so much going on. There's too many. And it's yeah. Stuffed is a good word to use. Thanks, Chris. Karen Chupless writes, I keep going over the switching between past and present and child adult pairings changing constantly in the flashback reveal. It just so spoke to me. They are saying we carry family hurt with us our whole lives. At least I felt them saying that. It's so, so heartbreaking to me that I get teary even remembering that scene. I had expected to be completely underwhelmed when that came because I think we all knew the gist of what was going to be. But the acting by all four of them, the way it was filmed, the way it was written, it just broke my heart. It makes me think of a song I love. Be careful how you send me. Be careful how you bend me. Careful how you end me. Be careful with me. Well, thank you, Karen. That whole scene between the, yeah, the young and the older, it it was very artfully done. It really was. And it made you think that they were not just living it again in their memories, but really living it again for Mm -hmm. the first time as adults. And, and, you know, Spock saying, you know, you don't have to apologize. And, uh, yeah, it was quite powerful. All right, Amy, you're probably gonna have to help me with this next name. Shoab Mirza. 
Okay. I was going to say that, but then I wasn't sure, so I apologize, listeners. Says, this week I chose to play a logic exercise to watch DSC, DSC with extra scrutiny and break down the plot, characters, and settings as objectively as possible for a lifelong Trekkie. Oh, who am I kidding? LOL. What a ride. From the opening sequence, I thought Space Channel Canada was airing a Discovery special before the episode aired. Having Talos 4 on DSC didn't tarnish pre-existing events or what is to come. In my opinion, this only serves to increase both Pike and Spock's motivations in the menagerie. Pike's flame for Vina is lit again, and he will long for solace only the Talosians can provide when he loses his mobility. Meanwhile, Spock utilizes his relationship with Burnham and the Talosians' abilities to help himself. If memory serves, we'll require many rewatches. Looking forward to everyone's comments this week and dissecting every moment from another beautiful episode. I completely agree. I'm going to have to watch this again. And, well, I will because we'll talk about this on another podcast yeah. in a few <laughs> weeks. So I'm going to have to watch it again or I'm going to forget what happened. But, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I like show up that you're like, all right, I'm going to watch it all logically. And that went out the window. All the feelings and emotions came rushing in. The, the show is so amazing how it does that. I was going to kind of do the same thing until those blue plants, they brought the blue plants. And I was so, <laughs> and then I just was giddy from the rest of it. I'm like, yes. Yeah. Thank you for bringing back the blue plants. <laughs> Rebecca Skipper writes, this is very interesting episode that honors TOS in the best way. They even kept the music we hear when TOS crew go to a planet. And you talked about that. Michael Burnham's leaving is very emotional for me as the viewer. Poor Spock. I feel bad for both of them. Notice how Burnham used the same term Kirk did. She uses the word half-breed. In a way, this is a very stupid sibling fight, and if Spock were fully Vulcan, he'd been able to cope better. His humanity saved him, yet left him vulnerable. How did Spock's mind go to a fluidic space? This reminds me of Cisco and the Prophets in DS9. I must say the menagerie will not be the same again. Pike and crew saved Spock's life. This makes his character even more complex, if Kirk only knew. Stamets is being treated so cruelly by Colber. I miss the old Colber. Although I do not like Tyler's character this season, I felt bad for him as well, though I am glad Pike is open-minded enough to realize that he is innocent. I'm totally blind and cannot see the trailer for next week, but should I assume that something is trying to kill Michael Burnham? Great comments, Rebecca. Oh, man, you just hit on so many. Interesting uh, that you bring up Kirk because Kirk used the term half-breed as well, right? Yeah, he does, but it's it's said in like a lighter tone, I think, than how Burnham says it. I mean, she does it because she does not want Spock following her and going with her, and, and she's trying to hurt him as much as possible. Kirk kind of says it to a degree as harshly, but not as harshly. So, yeah, that is very interesting. I didn't even think about Kirk calling Spock a half-breed at one point. So, Yeah. All righty. Jacqueline Mantell says, loved, loved, loved this episode. From the previously on TOS opening to Saru and Pike in the turbo lift to Ash and Hugh finally coming face to face. So many awesome moments. Burnham's quick bit about Spock's beard made me giggle. I wanted to watch the episode again as soon as it ended. I'm feeling anxious about the whole Arium thing and so, so sad for Paul and Hugh. I knew when Hugh started at Ash, there would be something about how they're both feeling the same way. Unsure of who they really are. Great episode once again. Yeah, and, and that was the hard part. The um, Colbert has that line about he feels, but he doesn't have any emotion to anything. And and he looks at, at Stamets and says anything. And you're just like, oh, my God, he has no love. He doesn't feel love for Stamets in that. And, oh, it's so hard. Yeah, I cried up a little bit. Justin Ozer writes, this was a great episode. On a first watch, the best way I can describe it is moody. And I mean that in a good way, as we explore so many different relationships and interactions while both revealing and deepening the main mystery. It was so wonderful to see Talos for the Talosians and Vina, along with Spock, Burnham, and Pike, and their relationship to Talos IV. I was glued to everything that was happening there. 
My heart breaks with the anger and confusion that Kolber has in seeing him effectively end his relationship with Stamets. I don't know where his storyline is going or if he may find purpose in something. I think he may not be a doctor again. I also love that we continue the tradition of Spock mind melding with so many different types of entities. The Red Angel is now on his mind meld list. Spock says the Red Angel is human and it's female. There is there any chance that it may be information the Red Angel is falsely feeding him for some reason? Otherwise, the only possibilities that come to mind are Michael, Ariam, and Amanda. Excited for next week. Hmm. That's a good pondering thought. I know. The mystery continues. Yes. Liam Smart says, yes, 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 yes. Now that was an episode. Beautiful scenes throughout the episode. The visual effects were stunning. The use of the cage was brilliant. I really can't fault the episode. Well, I can with one very minor thing with the place used for Talos, but I'm not even going to bother. It's not necessary. I th- felt the Talosians seemed a lot less frightening in this episode. Maybe that's because they knew what was coming and they knew they needed to help. Hot Spock's voice is so dreamy. <laughs> I do have a theory as to the whole storyline now, but I need to watch it again tomorrow and refresh my memory a bit of canon on a bit of canon before I can validate it. I was not crazy about the look of the Talosians, I will say, in this episode. So, well, I stick to my cage ones. (laughs) I sort of expected more of an uproar because we always hear such the loud noises they're changing the klingons and then they don't even say anything about the other races come on now that seems a little speciousists <laughs> it could be <laughs> but i think that's just because you know we've had so many different changes with the klingons already yeah so that should be expected but liam i am very interested to know your theory so make sure that we know it please comment Dennis Tremethick writes, Ethan Peck is truly amazing as Spock. I love this episode. It was enlightening to see Vina and the Telosians again. Now, the TOS episode, The Menagerie, makes more sense. We see the close connection between Spock and this mysterious race. It is all fascinating. Goodbye, Spock. Oh, was that not great? I loved it. <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Say goodbye, I enjoyed Spock. That. Yep. Goodbye, Spock. Melissa A. Bartell says, We watched The Cage on Netflix on Wednesday to be prepared for Thursday, and wow, am I glad we did. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, The previously on induced much squeeing. Melissa George's interpretation of Vina, both an homage to and an evolution of the original performance, lovely. Saru is approaching Elam Garrick levels of sass. I hope it continues, but still sensitive. Ash and Colbert, that needed to happen. And Spock. And Burnham. I buy them as siblings now, having seen them together in a way I could not from merely being told. Anson Mount continues to blow me away. Is Pike grayer in every episode or am I projecting? Too much else to comment on. Thank you, Melissa. I'm so glad that you watched The Cage. Please let us know if that was the first time that you've watched that episode. I would love to know how many people watch the cage for the very first time in preparation for this. Um, if Anson Mount is getting grayer, I am all for it because that salt and pepper is just, yeah, it's it's handsome. It is very much so. <laughs> all right. Daniel Murdoch writes a lot here, but there is always one scene, it seems, that keeps playing in my head in most episodes. This one, it's the scene with Pike and Vina. Anson Mount once again blows me away. The tenderness he shows to Vina, the caring, regret, the pain he feels, the trouble letting go. Wow, all in a few minutes. At one point, you could squint your eyes and see Jeffrey Hunter. And little Spock's pain. That young actor knocked it out of the park. Daniel, yeah, agreed completely. Oh my gosh, 100% agree with you. Uh, yeah, how uh, Pike and Vina interacted and young Spock. Oh, perfect casting. Well, and it's amazing that it's 10 years after the cage and Pike still has that pining feeling for Vina. That is how powerful those emotions were made in the cage. So it just makes it even more amazing that he left. Yeah. And like when he touches her hair, was that just... 
the perfect. Yeah. Oh, Ugh, I know. All right. We will have to talk more later on that. William J. Jackson says this episode really bo- broke the mold. Respect for what was adding layers to what came before deepening the red angel enigma. I say it's Michael. The cage is my favorite Trek episode, even more than the Andorian incident on ENT and DSC made that era so much more fascinating. Also the Burnham Spock, right? Sibling rivalry priceless. Well, and it's, so it's interesting. I put up a tweet the other day and I'm sure some people have seen it. And I said, I enjoy the cage and it's really interesting. I'm surprised how many responses I've gotten for people who are like, Oh, are we, did people not like this episode? And I think a lot of people, (laughs) yeah, you said that and I had other people say it and it's still kind of, I'm still getting responses every now and then. And I, the reason I put it up there is I think a lot of people dismiss the episode. Um, because if you watch it on the Blu-ray discs, it doesn't, it's not on the first, it's not the first episode you see, you see where no man has gone before. And it's on for the third season. It's at the end. And I think a lot of people dismiss the episode because it's the only one with, with Jeffrey Hunter as Pike. It's, it's, you know, with number one. And after that, we don't have those, some of those characters anymore and Spock's different. And, and so I really enjoy it. And I think a lot of people just kind of toss it to the side. They might watch it, but they don't really see it as affecting the show at all. So, but it does now as we for now sure. have. Yes. <laughs> Well, Jason Chapman writes, oh, what a good episode, but that one flashback scene where Michael called Spock a half-breed was like a dagger going through my heart. Many times in my own childhood have I heard that term from schoolmates and even family members. I am half Asian, half American. When I was younger, people constantly pointed that out to me. Oh, you're not a whole person or you're just a half-breed, they would tell me. Those words, half-breed, have followed me to my young adult life when I was in the Navy. It is interesting. I haven't heard that term half-breed for a long time. I was very surprised when I heard it again tonight on Discovery. After that very intense scene with Spock and Michael, I was mentally checked out. I could not focus on the ending to the episode. I will try to watch the rest tomorrow. Jason, thank you so much for your comment. Um, I think it just shows the validity of you know, how hurtful words can be. And I think many of us have, you know, with been treated so poorly and especially about, you know, your race and, and what are you and what makes you a whole person? This is, thank you so much for sharing your comment. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. And it's, it's hard when things trigger us in these episodes because we want to enjoy them and, and we see everybody else being able to enjoy it and we want to enjoy it in the same way and, and something just will trigger us in, in these. Um, I, I had some issues with Larka in season one. Um, lying really, really triggers me. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to rewatch the episode and, and get through that and so you can see the ending and enjoy it and be mentally present. But thank you again for, for sharing that. Well, I have a segment of bits and pieces, and I wanted to start off. Karen Chupless writes, um, were Jet's little drones cleaning up after the mess hall? I didn't even think about Jet Reno and her little drones, and I was wondering, what in the heck are these things? What are they? And now it makes sense. It's my headcanon now. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even think about those being her drones. I just figured they were just, you know, because we have the little things throughout any way that are cleaning up because we don't see janitors. <laughs> I know, but we janitor, never see right? what they are. And now it sort of makes sense. Cause you know, when yeah. we meet Reno for the first time, it's those little her mm-hmm. babies. Is that what she called them? Yeah. Her children or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. No, I, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Thanks Karen. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. All right. Janessa. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Do you know? Yeah, Amy. Janessa okay. Chiharda. Okay. Uh, she says, I just noticed Arium is called Arium 2.5 in the IMDb credits. Vina wearing high heels on gravel, on gravel make, gives me such anxiety. Yes, I uh, I didn't know about that about Arium, so that's interesting. And I, that could be because we have a new actress who's playing her. Yeah, that, that could be. Or maybe now that she's... She got an upgrade. And, uh, yes, from that future probe. <laughs> 
So yeah. And uh, Vina wearing high heels. Yeah, that her heels were definitely higher. If you if you watch the cage and you see the heels that she's wearing, um, they're more like little sandal heels. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah. And Mark Rodriguez says, why was Vina in heels? Was she given the illusion of sure footing on all that gravel and rock? Or perhaps the heels were an illusion to make her feel more glamorous. But yeah, I saw those heels and they were stiletto. They were pointy and tall. And I'm like, ah, no, she would not be wearing that. But Mark, I think you're right. Because when I watch the cage, like Vina is portrayed as very beautiful. And so I think that it definitely was, you know, reminding us that Vina is this beautiful and it could have been an illusion. Yeah. I mean, it really, yeah, I could see that. All right, Dan McWilliam says this episode and the two before it shows the first time we've brought someone back from the dead or some other seemingly irreversible situation, and yet it is not okay. How Colber, uh, he says 2.0, question mark, is coping with this new lease on life is fascinating. When Harry Kim 2.0 took over, it was like, oh, well. Spock was technically a 2.0, and he only acted eccentric for two movies as he got his memories back. Jordy and Picard were basically back to work and having their same relationships be just fine after being turned into a lizard thing and Borg, respectively. I couldn't agree with you more, Dan. Thank you for also noticing that we finally have someone be not okay. And, yeah. and that's always bothered me with Trek. <laughs> yeah. That there's no, you know, after. Repercussions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So great thought there, Dan. All right. Now here in postcards, we don't always read the positive. We do have some questions and concerns. Uh, so Haley, start us off. All right. Alexandra Sandu says, I loved, loved, loved this episode, but. I do have one nitpick that bothered me while I was watching. I didn't buy the Telosians wanting to see that one particular moment in Burnham's memory. It was such a cheap narrative device that took me out of it for a while. Still love the episode, but I wanted to get this off my chest. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, I agree. It was kind of annoying, but I think the reason why they needed it is because they were trying to restore Spock. And without all the memories, how can you restore one's mind fully back to where it's supposed to be? Okay. All right. I have more to say, but I'm going to save it for the main show. But I <laughs> agree, Alexandra. I wrote that down in my notes. Um, and so I don't think it's a nitpick. I think it's a valid concern because I mm -hmm. share it as well. Matthew Bell says, love this episode on so many levels. However, I really wish Discovery would leave interstellar distances well alone as they never seem to get it right from the location of Starbase 1 last season to Starbase 11 this episode, just two light years from the Talos star system. Not only is that absurdly close for neighboring stars, but according to Spock in the Menagerie, it's a six-day journey at maximum warp from one to the other. Even at the absurdly inaccurate and slow warp factor cubed formula, that's equivalent to warp five. Do they imagine that the Enterprise is still using NX-01 technology? You know, uh, Matthew, I sort of wondered that myself. And I'm like, yeah, why is Starbase 11 so close? So interesting point there, Matthew. Hmm. Did you even think about that. it? Yeah. <laughs> I had to think about that a little bit more. I wish uh, if someone has the uh, stellar cartography pulled out, I, I've been meaning to buy it. But uh, and take a look and let us know in the comments what you think, because I'm sure that there's something out there. So, yeah, I have the book. It just is at school right now with all my other truck yeah. stuff. So I get it. I've been to your place. There's not much there. Yeah. You really need your little corner at your apartment <laughs> for reference books and things when you need them handy. Uh, yes, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Rodriguez says, I didn't see the necessity or logic behind showing us scenes from the cage. For me, it only served to point out the differences between then and now. I had started to really see Mount as Pike. Then I'm reminded of the dissimilarity. Same with Spock. Newbies didn't really need those scenes, so I don't see the point. Also, with the makeup technology as good as it is now, the real Vena effect could have been much better. Also, the original Telosians were much more frail-looking, showing their lack of physicality. I wonder why they abandoned that aspect. 
We did not learn any more about the planet's death penalty prohibition. I feel the show is shoehorning nostalgic characters, items, and situations into their stories merely for the effect many fans are having rather than them flowing organically. Given all of that, I am enjoying Discovery more this season than last season. They have done some good Star Trek standalone message stories with all fitting them into the overall story arc. Well, Mark, here you are again in this segment of Postcards. Now, uh, it's interesting that you see the dissimilarities because when I see it, I just see the similarities, you know? And I guess it's just a matter of how you're viewing it and You know, and I totally get the differences between then and now, but that's what makes me excited is those differences. Like when they did that previously, I was like, man, that was back in the sixties and now look at it. And it just, I don't know, to me, it did not bother. And I I loved it and I love those differences and it didn't, you know, conflict me like it does you, Mark. And Tony Salazar says, while I really love the previously on using footage from the cage, I'm kind of surprised they didn't redo those scenes. They had all the pieces in place to recreate it, and it would have been cool to see it in a modern context. It would have spoiled the appearances of Vina, though, who I wasn't at all expecting to see. So again, another fan response of, you know, maybe redo it. I can see original TOS fans being very angry about that. If they had redone the scenes with the crew that we have now and the characters as we have them now, and granted the back, like aside from Pike and Spock, everybody else and number one, um, everybody else on the bridge scenes that they showed and stuff would have been, you know, could have been anybody. But however, I think, I think there would have been a lot of uproar of people going like, why did they redo that? And they didn't need to redo that. They should have just, I can see the opposite. People would have said, why didn't they just use the scenes that they already had from when the original cage was filmed? So that brings a point uh, going back to a previous uh, listener's comments. Like what if they had reshot Tribbles and Tribulations? you know, and recast Kirk, Spock, you know, and made it fit DS9 era, I think that would have been a humongous uproar. It would have minimized and almost deleted the original, you know, feeling of that all. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. So that's, that's how I feel about that. All right. So I'm going to give yes, this one to you. One. Yep. Uh, it's my co-host. So my co-host over on Standard Orbit, Zach Moore, says the recap of the cage was a huge mistake. Oh, Zach, we're going to have words. Mainly due to the execution. It really felt like they needed to recap the cage. They should have reshot the scenes with the new cast on the new sets. Seeing the 2250s the way it's supposed to look completely broke suspension of disbelief that this was the same Star Trek as what's come before. Completely throwing out the TOS aesthetic in this series, then showing actual clips from TOS leading into the episode was disconnecting to say the least. It would be like if Superman Returns started with the prologue of a montage of footage from the Christopher Reeve Superman movies and the way it was done with animations and cutouts and then remixed TOS music felt like a goofy YouTube video experiment more than a pre-episode recap. Oh, Zach. Oh, Zach. (laughs) I get what he's saying. Um, I know he's, you know, uh, anyway, I'm going to have to have a talk with Zach. Yeah. (laughs) So interesting. Uh, the comments about this just because I loved it so much. Well, and again, I think this goes back to, you know, yes, they could have redone it. They could have said, okay, we'll just make a montage of, of different scenes from, from the cage, but do it with Anson Mount and Ethan Peck and Rebecca Romain you know, and then the new actress who's playing Vina. But again, I was kind of surprised that we were seeing Vina. I wasn't sure if we were going to. And I liked that we got that tie in. So yes, they could have done it. But again, I think it would have taken away from some of what the cage had already established. And I think that it would have made that less important. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. 
Joshua DeVries writes, I feel like this episode will work better once viewed with the whole season. Right now, it's more chess piece shuffling to set things up for later. It was amazing to see Vina again and to see Spock being Spock. But my only thought at the end of the episode is, I need the rest of the story rather than reflecting on how satisfying the plot was. Also, I really hope Paul and Hugh are okay. Yeah, um, I can see it's definitely setting up the chessboard still. And I'm like, come on, let's get, you know, I mean, I don't want it to end, but I want some answers. Yeah, and I, I can see that too. And it it is hard. And honestly, I think that, I again, I don't watch the next time on. So I'm wondering if that's part of it because you're seeing what's coming up next. So then you're like even more like, come on, look, come on. I want it now. I want it now. So maybe my, my recommendation is maybe don't watch the next time on and just sit and ponder on what we've seen so far up to this point and then the episode that you just watched and just see if that because then it allows you to speculate in your own mind a little bit if you want to, rather than sitting there going, okay, I know what's coming next week. Can I have it now? I want it now. I want it now. Um, that's our mentality these days. We instant gratification. We need that delayed gratification. And so that would be my recommendation. That is a great recommendation because I get, Joshua, your exact point and what you're saying, Haley, like, we just had this amazing episode and then it's like, okay, next week we're going to see this. And then we are disregarding, well, not disregarding, but we are now focused on, well, what are we going to see? And then your mind starts speculating and we didn't even have time to process the episode we just saw. So mm-hmm. great. I, I immediately point. am like, la, 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 la. like I hit pause and I plug my ears if I can't hit pause right away. Cause yes. I'm like, nope, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Yes. Well, Haley, how do you think the fans responded to this week's episode? I appreciate everybody's responses. And I think it's great that we are still criticizing, but still saying that we love the episode or we enjoyed the episode or aspects of the episode. Um, And it's nice to see that people aren't going like, oh, my God, I hate this episode. There was nothing in it that I liked. And and still seeing that positivity, which I think is really great um, that we need to see in this fandom. I loved some people's ideas. I'm going to have to sit and think about some of this stuff and go, hmm, maybe, I don't know. What does this mean? Um, and I, again, I'm loving that everybody went back and either rewatched The Cage in prep for this episode or watched it for the first time. Let me know if you watched it for the first time what you thought because I enjoyed it, so – Yeah. And again, just the number of comments and I do apologize that I couldn't read them all. (laughs) All I think that would take forever. (laughs) But (laughs) several hours. (laughs) Yeah. I try to get a nice little section slice of what people are saying. And, and listeners, if you haven't had a chance to go through and read all the side threads and the, you know, sub comments and stuff, it's, it's really great stuff. So be sure to check out our complete Discovery coverage here on the network. Live from the Edge airs on Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, so you can watch Bruce and Brandy ask questions live and will be released as a podcast on Saturday mornings. Have you been able to participate at all this season with live? I finally did, actually, uh, a couple weeks ago. It was really interesting. Uh, there was many jokes that I was a red angel. A, I was wearing a red shirt, and B, I kept freezing because at the time, the internet I had in my apartment really was crappy. So uh, it was quite fun. Actually, yeah. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have our commentary that is available as Tracks from the Edge with Mike and Max. And, of course, you can fat- catch full analysis on the Edge main show, with Patrick and myself, and we will be getting notes from The Edge, which links Discovery and the Brada franchise with Chris Jones, and that'll probably happen after Season 2 is finished. You can find all of these in the main feed for The Edge and in the Trek.fm master feed. We'd love to hear your thoughts on Discovery, and the best place to do that is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook, where I will, of course, collect your feedback for Postcards from The Edge. You can also find us on Twitter at Trek FM or send us email using the contact form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. 
choose to send to a show and select the edge that will come right to me. And I love reading your emails. So Haley, where can people contact you and let you know if they watch the cage for the first time? Yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter. I am at Trekkie01D. I'm also, again, over on Standard Orbit. And I'm also on uh, the Discoville podcast with you. Yes. And a couple of lovely gentlemen. Yes, you can (laughs) find me here on the network where I co-host The Edge with Patrick Devlin. I also co-host Earl Gray with Richard Marquez and Justin Ozer, which is about the next generation. You can, as Haley mentioned, find me on the Fandom Podcast Network, Discoville, where we talk the Orville and Discovery. That is a fun mix. Love it. You can find me on Twitter at Miss Amy Nelson, but my favorite place right here on the Babel Conference. If you'd like to help us keep all of our shows going and even become an associate producer, visit patreon.com slash trekfm for all the details. And I would like to take this time to appreciate and thank our associate producers. They are Norm Lau. Hi, Norm. Tony Robinson, Thomas Puleo, Lisa Slack, Shoab Mirza, Richard Rutledge, James Muldrow, Cornelia Reutner, Ryan Mallett, Chris Trebuzio, and Brian Maloche. Thank you for supporting Trek FM and especially The Edge. Well, thank you, Haley, for coming on Postcards, had your glasses on to read everything, had a nice (laughs) voice to clearly represent what our listeners had to say. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, glasses are necessary. (laughs) So join us next week for another episode of Postcards from the Edge. Hailing frequencies open. Open.